welcome everybody to our third event uh, in First Thought Talks for 2023. And this is a very special event. These are two extremely eminent people that we have on the right here. I'm slightly intimidated by them both, uh, but I have elected to ask them certain questions with their approval. On your behalf, and you will have a chance yourselves to ask certain questions uh, at the end. So, short introduction. Our former Taoiseach Charles Sohi, the man who paid no tax at all in the 1960s, <laughs> once referred to economics as the dismal science. He was quoting Thomas Carlyle, who came up with the description in the mid-19th century, when Malthus's predictions of mass starvation due to unfettered population growth were causing widespread gloom. Of course, politicians like to denigrate economists when they're warning them not to be profligate with public money, and Hohe was not the first or the last to do so. We're used to reading, seeing, and hearing economists in our media, and they do a very good job of explaining complex phenomena to the public. Some acquire superstar status, like Morgan Kelly, do you remember him? Who was credited, rightly or wrongly, with predicting the terrible financial crisis of 2008. That could be disputed, but we're not going to discuss it today because God knows where it might lead. Others patiently interpret data to try to give us some idea of where we stand financially at any given moment and what the consequences of that might be. Now, we have two extremely eminent economists here today. They have sworn an oath not to talk about logarithms or other arcane tools of their trade, but to answer my uninformed questions about issues we all think are important to our understanding of where Ireland is now. John McHale, here in the middle, is Professor of Economics at the J.E. Kearns School of Business and Economics, the University of Galway, which incidentally is a partner with the Galway Arts Festival. So we're always really happy to have anyone from NUIG come and participate. He previously served as Executive Dean of the College of Business, Public Policy and Law, and also as Director of the Whitaker Institute for Innovation and Societal Change. Prior to joining the University of Galway, John held positions at Harvard University and Queen's University, Ontario. His published work has appeared in journals such as the Journal of Development Economics, the Journal of Urban Economics, the Journal of Economic Geography and Research Policy. Professor McHale was chair of the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council from its inception in 2011 to 2016, and he has been an independent member of the National Economic and Social Council and the Pensions Board. He served as president of the Irish Economic Association from 2016 to 2018. So he was the man who had to begin telling the government not to be spending money when they didn't have it. And we're going to ask him many questions about how that went. <laughs> John Fitzgerald, over further away from me, has been a research affiliate at the Economic, Social Re Economic and Social Research Institute, the ESRI. We've had many wonderful ESRI people here uh, over the years at First Thought since November 2014. Prior to that, he was a research professor at the ESRI and program coordinator of the macroeconomics and energy policy research fields. He became a member of the Royal Irish Academy in 2011, and he's an honorary fellow of GMIT and TCD. He's currently an adjunct professor in the Department of Economics at Trinity College Dublin, and also in the School of Electoral, Electrical and Electronic Engineering. I might get you to explain that at some stage uh, in UCT. <laughs> in collaboration with other colleagues in the SRI, he helped to develop the ESRI's macroeconomic modeling program. Over his career there, he has published extensively in the fields of macroeconomics, energy economics, and environmental economics. He's former president of the Association of Instituts Européens de Conjoncture Économique, please forgive my bad French accent, of the Irish Economic Association of the Statistical and Social Inquiry Society of Ireland. He was a member of the Commission of the Central Bank of Ireland, of the National Economic and Social Council, and of the Board of the Northern Ireland Authority for Energy Regulation. He was, importantly, Chairman of the Climate Change Advisory Council between 2016 and 2021, and he remains an ordinary member of that council. So we're going to be very interested in hearing what John has to say about that crucial question of climate change and what the economic consequences of it might be. So I'm going to ask both of you first a sort of historical question. How have 50 years membership of the EU, as it is now, affected Ireland? Is it the single most important driver of change since independence? We start with you, John F. Right, just to say why I'm proud to be a dismal scientist. Yes. Um, Carlyle was upset because he was a slave owner. He was. And John Stuart Mill, said slavery was wrong, and that's why he called us dismal scientists. So it's a badge of honour for all these It is, and especially if Charlie Ho, he calls you dismal. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of EU membership, um, uh, I think most people tend to think immediately about the economy, but for me it is the change in society and the political system which it brought. Um, I joined the Department of Finance in September 1972, 
And I put away all the files in Aaron's external economic relations, which was about going to London as a mendicant. And I found myself in September 73 representing Aaron, discussing the economic forecast for Europe. And suddenly, all civil servants found that you played on a European stage and you learnt on a European stage. Even more important at a personal level, um, I, I, I got married in September 72. And my wife, who was senior to me in the Department of Finance, was fired the day we got married because there was a marriage had bar. To give up her job. And that, um, when we joined the EU, that changed in June 73. It became illegal. Uh, equal pay for equal work. The EU required Ireland. I was paid as a married man more than single women are, uh, uh, more than any women who are left um, and single men. That was uh, deemed illegal by the EU. So it's the changes in society, it, first of all through law, but also through uh, seeing how other countries work. And even in terms of industrial relations, I remember being in the bar often in uh, Brussels airport, late on a Friday night, plane delayed an hour. Who do you see sitting there having a beer together? The leader of the Congress of Trade Unions, the leader of IBEC. Mm -hmm. um, they'd been at a, a very boring meeting in Brussels and they found themselves- Some people would read very sinister overtones into that well, drink. I, 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 I think they learned to work together. And if you look at industrial relations today in Britain and industrial relations today in Ireland, Britain is reverting to the old ways. We do things differently. So it is the changes to society. The other thing is just in terms of the economy. It's the single market in 1993. Um, until then, Germany bought German pharmaceuticals, German computers, um, and so on. France bought CITL, cartel equipment. Um, much of the Galway economy depends on pharmaceuticals, healthcare equipment. Um, that business grew up after 1993 because in Europe, you buy European, our world, you don't buy domestic. So the, the, much of the business of, 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 of Galway and of the Irish economy depends on it. So yes, it has transformed the economy, um, but it has also transformed society and politics and playing on a European stage rather than looking to London for how things are done. Nobody today would think of that. Um, it's the last place you'd look. Very true indeed. John M, what's your view on this historical question? Uh, thanks, Katrina. Thanks, John. Uh, so first of all, uh, I'm absolutely uh, delighted to see so many people uh, come out for this. Uh, I couldn't believe uh, when I saw that it was actually sold out for a <laughs> session entitled Two Economists, uh, which could be the, the, the punchline to, to a joke, what's worse than an economist. Uh, so, uh, I'm absolutely delighted to, uh, to, to be here. Um, I think uh, John sets out very well the transformative uh, effect of European Union uh, membership. But, but I think, and I think John would agree that uh, European membership is just sort of part of a, of a package of things that really underlines the um, Irish development story that would include, of course, uh, the huge investments in, in human capital uh, that really intensified uh, from the 1960s onwards. But, in response to your question, Katrina, in terms of really picking out the thing that I think that's most unique to the Irish development story, uh, that is very much, I think, complementary uh, to European membership, uh, the thing that really stands out for me that makes Ireland distinctive is the way that we've become a base for multinational uh, investment, partly because of European membership. And I think it's useful to, to put this in a uh, sort of global context. If we think of what, what's happening in the global economy, over the last uh, 50 years. So it's a, been a period of globalization, uh, integration of the international economy. Uh, it's also been a period of uh, apparent uh, rapid technological development, particularly in uh, uh, digital uh, related technologies. And it's also been a period uh, of rising in inequality and actually quite disappointing growth uh, over uh, that period. And one of the things that's been contributing to the inequalities, the rise of superstar firms. But somehow or other, Ireland has managed to become really a base for these so-called uh, superstar firms. And when I say superstar firms, I'm referring to the, to the Googles and the, and the Facebooks and the, and the Intels, and you can maybe include Big Pharma uh, in that as well. Uh, but these are firms that uh, are very specialized in uh, intangible assets, their intellectual property, rather than 
the sort of the, the, the heavy industrialization of old. But Ireland has managed to really to, uh, to, to, uh, to become really attractive with the, with the package that it, that, that it offers. And I think that is the mm -hmm. single thing that uh, has most, most distinguishes uh, the Irish economy from uh, other uh, uh, advanced uh, economies. Uh, and the success, I think, was not, was not a given. Um, I, I sort of came of age to economics in the, uh, in the 1980s, and one book I remember reading at the time was Joe Lee's uh, Ireland, yeah. uh, Politics and, and Society. And, and it was published at the very end of the, uh, of the 80s, and there's a particular uh, section in a chapter there that compares Ireland's performance and potential. Uh, and uh, it, the story really was that we were uh, underperforming relative to that potential. But of course, the base had already been set in previous decades, but we really didn't know it at the time. Uh, and then we had the, uh, uh, the Celtic, Celtic Tiger period that, that followed, which absolutely transformed the economy. It didn't end uh, uh, particularly well, uh, but the, the living standards that we experience today are very much the result of that. So if I, uh, recognizing the importance of European Union membership, but, but if I was to pick out the one thing that really distinguishes Ireland, uh, it is that uh, multinational um, part of the, the, the economy uh, that really has been the, the, the growth engine for okay, us. Okay, thanks for that. I mean, obviously, membership of the European Union is a huge driver for foreign direct investment. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Because we are an entry point into the, the a yeah. huge market. Yeah, yeah. And that must be important to them. Another question, which is becoming historical, uh, and thank goodness in lots of ways, we've become a much more diverse society um, with migration changing our workforce, our culture, our neighbours, and our relatives. How do both of you think we have done in that respect? I mean, it obviously has economic implications, but also broader societal implications, and it could have gone a different way. So, John, Ed? I think Ireland's experience is different from, say, a country like France. Um, first of all, we have become far more diverse, and there are reasons why it has been particularly good for Ireland, leading to less resistance. But the first thing is um, uh, Irish people emigrated. So many emigrated. And then from the 1970s onwards, it turned out that people were homing pigeons, that they went and came back. And in the late 1980s, you're probably too young to remember Gay Byrne saying the Gay Byrne Earn. You might as well go. There's no hope for you here, rather the Joe Lee version of history. Um, and they went and never expect to come back, but they came back. And the research done by Alan Barrett and colleagues in the ESRI shows people who emigrate and come back, controlling for qualifications and so on, earn 10% more and help to turn Ireland round in the 1990s. They came back like, you couldn't get a cup, decent cup of coffee in Dublin. All these people came back from Paris or Berlin or whatever, looking for coffee. Um, and so it changed the culture. So the first thing is returning immigrants. And it is interesting to look at, say, the government. Simon Coveney um, worked in Britain for a period. Pascal Don he studied in Britain. Pascal Donoghue worked in Britain for was it five, 10 years. Our politicians have done J1 in the United States. They have seen the outside world and come back. So that the, it's for, that's in terms of Irish people. And the foreigners who've come to Ireland in very large numbers tend to be highly educated. And on average, they are better educated than the already educated Irish population. And you don't tend to notice them when your, your daughter's boyfriend is not Irish, um, working for Google or whatever. So that the integration and the census in 2006, the CSO did an interesting run. 15% of children aged between zero and five had one parent who was Irish born and one who was not Irish born. Now, what better integration can you get than that? So we have been fortunate that we've attracted the best and the brightest from around Europe and now increasingly from elsewhere. And when I talk to Americans and say, actually, more Americans have emigrated to Ireland than Irish have emigrated to America in the last 20 or 25 years, they kind of look at you in surprise. But it has brought new skills um, uh, and helped us innovate. And uh, even more, I think, the foreigners coming back, the Irish coming back, have rather changed our outlook on the world um, uh, 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 and 
not just bringing coffee to Ireland. So that's why I think I, I, I shouldn't get too hit up about coffee. But uh, coffee is important. It, it, it is the co having seen the outside world, know it's a good place and work with it. Like one of my concerns would be increasingly Irish people they spend a period in Australia or Canada or whatever. In the 80s, quite a lot of people actually spent time in Germany or France. Mm -hmm. And where we are poor is on people working in continental Europe within the EU and learning foreign languages. We are depending on the Poles who come to Ireland to speak Polish. We're depending on the French who come to Ireland to speak French. I was just looking at the first professor of German in, in, in NUIG, uh, panel on her. Now, she went to work for MI6, I think, afterwards. But it's not that we want MI6 I to come and work that here. Means. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's all fascinating. Um, it's, I mean, coffee is important. I'm not in any way denigrating <laughs> the importance of a good cup of coffee, and we've all learned that. And there are now baristas everywhere, and it's, it's a whole different thing. But I suppose we were a very homogeneous culture. Uh, very conservative mm. Catholic culture until a certain point. Obviously, the, the things that you outlined earlier, John, about the EU, we were dragged kicking and screaming, particularly in terms of women's rights, yeah. into the late 20th yeah. century by joining the EU because these things had to be done. They weren't, of course, done immediately, and there were all sorts of things that took much longer to, to arrange. Um, but I think the whole business of, of opening up the variety of religions available in the country or none. Mm. The color of people's skin being something we, we now could look at and think about, mm. where in other countries we did have, and I'm wondering if the difference here is that we were not a colonial state. We didn't have a Windrush generation. We didn't have Algerians coming to live in France. We didn't have any of that stuff going on. So we weren't in a situation where we, there was a payback, if you like, that often stirred up really difficult racist responses on behalf of pre previously colonial countries. Uh, I think we did better than we might have, to be honest with you. What do you think, John? Uh, uh, yes, if, if I could just uh, maybe talk about the, the immigration sure. uh, side of things as well as the, uh, the, the immigration and, and, uh, and get your question, uh, Katrina. So I mentioned uh, multinationals as being something that makes the Irish economy distinctive. The, the other really distinctive thing about the Irish economy is just the variability and mobility of our, our population. Uh, one picture that leaves me in awe every time I see it, and I typically take a look at it after sort of each census, is showing the, the population of, of Ireland at each census going back to 1941. Mm. It really is just a striking picture that uh, in what is now you know, the Republic of Ireland, the, the population was six and a half million in 1841 and then fell at each census, to, uh, reaching its lowest point in 1961 of 2.8 million. That, that is just a shocking change in, in population, uh, driven, of course, initially by um, that's in the, in, in the famine, but, but mainly from the immigration that followed it. And then in every census afterwards, you see the population rising. Uh, and in the most recent, recent census, rising to, uh, to, to, to 5.2 million. And in the 1950s, where I think Ireland realized it really had to change uh, the, the way it did things, it took a really while for those things to have an effect, you know, 400,000 people uh, emigrated for, from a population of less than uh, 3 million at the time. And then since this is a sort of a personal story, so my, my dad, who had um, uh, left school or didn't have opportunities to continue in school after uh, age 12 had actually emigrated uh, to England in the in the 1950s and my mother emigrated uh, in the early 1960s and that's where they uh, they met and got married and then returned to Ireland in the late 1960s and in a sense I emigrated at the very end of the 80s but under sort of very different circumstances uh, and uh, lived for uh, almost 20 years in the in, in the US and Canada uh, before being almost probably the only one returning in 2009, which is the beginning of the <laughs> wow. financial crisis, wow. which is absolutely fascinating for an economist, by the yeah. way. We shouldn't uh, ad 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 admit that. Um, and uh, I, I, as John says, I think the, the, the emigration of recent decades is very different from that earlier emigration, uh, where as long as things turn around quickly enough, which mm. they did mm. after the recession in the 1980s, pe people do tend uh, to come back. And I think we saw that after the financial crisis as well. And, and that returning immigration, I think, was transformative. I remember um, 
even as a, as a student, seeing how people who went on, on J1s uh, for the summer, how their outlook on the world completely changed yeah. from, mm. their, uh, from their few months. Uh, but, to, but to get to the, uh, the inward migration, the immigration uh, uh, side of things, um, uh, you know, one of the, I think, really positive aspects of the Celtic Tiger uh, was the attraction of people in, initially from the, uh, the new accession states of the European Union. Poland, Lithuania, Latvia. And you know, interestingly, in the most recent census, the, the, the largest inflows are coming from India and Brazil, so mm. it's kind of a changing mix. Uh, but I think that's been something that's been really positive uh, for Ireland uh, in terms of changing outlooks, bringing diversity, uh, different cultures. I would say we've done reasonably well in mm. terms of, uh, of integration. And I think the arts is one area, I think, seemingly, you know, kind of from the outside, that has done very well. You really see uh, d diverse sort of faces, particularly young people, young talent, mm. uh, coming into to the arts. Other areas, maybe less so well, if you kind of scan the faces in the Dáil Shannon, you don't, yes. diversity is not something that, uh, uh, that immediately comes to mind. Uh, and, then, and then there's the, the, the issue of racism, and again, Compared to other places, we sort of don't have the same sort of overt racism, I think, um, largely uh, sort of for the reasons that you describe. But I do think that uh, racism is a bit more hidden yeah, in I Ireland agree. than it is uh, elsewhere. Uh, you know, you don't really you know, see it in the media, for instance, in the way you might see it in cert certain parts of the media elsewhere. But I'm sure, you know, uh, Everybody here has talked to, uh, to people who really do experience uh, racism. And I think it's made worse by the tensions in the, in the housing market at the moment where people are uh, competing for accommodation. So I don't think we should be too self-congratulatory uh, and that we, uh, we do have a ways to go and to recognize the, the difficulties that uh, people, particularly you know, and, and non-white people, uh, face here. Uh, uh, and I think it's, it's more than, uh, than you might realize. Just oh, it is. And there's plenty the, of evidence that people do experience yeah. it. The one yeah. barrier where you do not see migration is across the border on this island. That's right. Very few people from Northern Ireland come to the Republic. Very few people from the Republic go to Northern. And even in terms of commuting across the border, you would expect people from the North to take jobs in the South. They're better paid. They don't. So why that barrier is there, we we'll leave for another day. And that, we could have a whole session on the whole mm. business of the border, north and south, all of that, and we, we won't have time to do that today. So now, uh, Professor John McHale. You were in charge of the Irish Fiscal Council from 2011 to 2016. And what everyone wants to know at the moment is, what is the government going to do with the alleged bonanza from corporation tax that's supposed to be coming our way? The job of the council? was to give prudent advice to the government which might stop it from overspending. But there are so many deficits in our infrastructure that require investment. Housing being one that's come up already, being the most pressing need, which is now becoming something that has a dampening effect on our economy mm -hmm. because people who want to come here, for example, nurses, although I will never understand how it is that we train nurses to emigrate the next day to Australia, and we're importing nurses from India and various other places. They come here and they've nowhere to live. Uh, and some of them are going home again. And I don't understand how we got to this point, but is there not a case to be made that if there is a lot of money, that you spend it on things like improving the housing stock and dealing with public transport, which is, again, for John F. to think about, given his concerns about climate change. We're not there yet, by any means, with either of these two things. Would that be the kind of advice that you might give the government if you were in charge of the Fiscal Council still? Um, or would you say, put this money into a rainy day fund or pay down our enormous deficit? Horrible question, I know. Yeah, it's a, uh, uh, it's a difficult one. Uh, when I was on the, the Fiscal Council, my kids who would hear me on the radio would say that, uh, is your job given out about the government? Which uh, it, cer <laughs> it certainly felt like uh, at, the, uh, at the time. I'm happy that somebody else uh, has, that, uh, has that job. Now, uh, certainly the government is facing a very challenging situation, which is unusual in the sense that you know, we have these large budget surpluses. So they're projecting a 10 billion surplus for this year and 12 billion next year rising uh, in 2026 to close to 20 billion. So this is an unusual situation. And you know, it is 
much better place to be to have these, uh, uh, these surpluses than if we were facing deficits. But it does create a big sort of political challenge for the government where there are clearly big needs in terms of physical investment but also social investment. Uh, people's living standards have been very much hit by, by inflation. So there are lots of needs uh, out there. Uh, but this is where uh, 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 people really don't like what economists have to say. We also have an economy that is very close to overheating, if not overheating uh, all, already. And actually, uh, usually when we think of overheating, we think of inflation and loss of competitiveness. Uh, I heard John recently give what I thought was a, uh, a really good way of thinking about the current overheating problem in the sense that it's more about crowding out uh, investment, that you know, if the, uh, you know, the economy is overheating because of you know, very so strong consumption, it really takes resources uh, away uh, from being able to make the kind of investments uh, to deal with the uh, various types of infrastructure uh, deficits that you're, uh, that you're talking about. Uh, but typically the advice from economists is to operate a uh, counter-cyclical fiscal policy so you don't want to be adding extra sort of heat to the economy at a time that it's overheating. We also have the, the issue that there really is a risk around the sustainability of corporate tax revenues. My guess is that they're more likely to go up than down, mm. but the, there is a, a real possibility of a substantial reduction in those. And we were here in the, in the 2000s with the property tax revenue, and we saw what that led to and uh, what people said at the time, how could you have let that happen and sort of never again? Uh, should you let that happen, which is really why the Fiscal Council was, uh, uh, was put in, in place to try to institutionalize that, me that memory of what people really uh, uh, wanted to make sure sort of wouldn't happen again, which is why you get that kind of advice coming from the Fiscal Council. Uh, and then there were sort of longer term issues. So even if we keep you know, our tax system as it is and the, the broad structures of our social protection system as it is, uh, because of population aging, the surpluses that we have at the moment are going to, in, you know, in the coming years and decades, turn into deficits. And that is with really no major policy changes. It's just the structure of the population changing. Uh, so we shouldn't uh, be you know, overly impressed with the surpluses that we have uh, at the moment, and we need to start uh, preparing for that. So it is going to be a balancing act. Uh, my sense in, in terms of the policy that was laid out most recently in the summary economic statement is that it's, it's, it's reasonable. It, it, uh, it is moving away from the expenditure rule that the government had put in place a couple of years ago, which was limiting expenditure increases to 5%. So it's going a little bit more than that to allow for inflation. And I don't think that's um, uh, indefensible. And also spending a bit more on capital spending to deal with some of the deficits that you were talking about, uh, Katrina. My concern is not so much with the policy that was set out in the summary economic statement, uh, but if you remember back to last year's budget, uh, they had also put out what I thought was a quite a sensible summary economic statement. And then you got a frenzy mm -hmm. of initiatives in the days leading up to the, uh, to the budget, uh, which was incredibly politically successful. You may remember all these sorts of uh, one-off uh, measures, but it's no way to do uh, uh, fiscal policy. And I think we may end up in the, the same situation in, in, in this uh, budget again. But it, you know, it's reflecting the sorts of political pressures that the government yeah, I mean, is under. There, there, there are, are real needs. The money seems to be there. Mm. You know, why aren't you uh, you're using it? I know uh, it does. It does. Yeah. It's hard to explain to people. It is hard. To I explain know to it's people. very yeah. simplistic to say yeah. there will be a fantastic bonanza of up to sixty-five million or billion, which is really yeah. extravagant, uh, of corporation tax. Yes we have people screaming to find places to live in. And it's yep. causing real human misery. We have huge deficits in disability provision in this country. I know that requires staffing and people, which is ongoing expenditure, which can't be funded except with uh, the, the, the revenues we take in a, in a normal way. But things that are one-off expenditure would seem to a lot of people to be a reasonable proposition. John, you'll have views on this. Um, uh, similar to John's surprise, surprise. Um, uh, the way I view it is, if you go, go to a IKEA tomorrow and buy 100,000 house kits, yeah. and if I could stick up a house kit the following day, we could solve the problem. It, money would be no object. The problem is we've got to make them in Ireland. Mm. And where are the people? And the people who 
uh, who, who could make them are earning 100,000 a year working for Google, or they're working for Pfizer, or they're working um, in the multinational sector. And I am a little concerned that that sector is growing and growing. And it's extremely wealthy, and those of us who are, have houses are doing extremely well out of it. But we actually need more people building stuff in Ireland because we can't buy it from abroad. And how we, how we get there, um, because you don't turn a computer programmer or cyber expert from Google into a plumber in the morning. Um, it's not that easy. Um, but the, and you, the answer which we d did in the 2000-2007 period, we hired the plumbers, all the plumbers. You couldn't get one in Estonia or Latvia. They were all in Ireland. Now, because of the cost of living in Ireland, they've nowhere to live. Yeah. So they're, they're better off in Estonia and Latvia. So it's a pretty intractable problem. And if IKEA were the solution, the government has the money, but it's not the solution. Mm. We're going to have a man talking here next week whose name is Hugh Brennan who runs a not-for-profit uh, housing firm. And they import modular housing, which is much easier to, to yes. put up, much mm -hmm. faster to do. And they've already been able to produce yeah. houses in Poppentry near Ballymun at, at a sale cost yeah. of 149,000. That's reasonable pricing for Way housing. To go. Why can't that be scaled up? Yes, there will be a problem about getting enough people. But it seems to me that it has not been recognised by government or by the civil service or by the local authorities mm. that this actually is a crisis. I think there's a, a failure to get it that we're, we really are in real trouble about this. And it's dividing our society by generation. Yeah. Uh, those of us who are old enough to have been able to buy houses at a certain mm. time are, as you said, John, mm. doing fine. But the younger generation are rightly resentful and angry, having to live at home with their parents in some cases till they're in their 40s and seeing no prospect of ever owning their own home. Anyway, that's, that, that is that issue. Um, I want John Fitzgerald to turn to you now on the biggest threat facing the planet at the moment, which is climate change. And we're looking all around us this summer. There are people who are delighted to come to Ireland because it rains and it's cold. <laughs> Instead of burning to death, as a friend of mine is doing in Sicily, although he's refusing to believe that's happening, but there he is in 46 degree temperatures and thinking it's okay. It's not okay. Um, we're, I think there's, there's going to be, obviously we're going to see more and more of this. The climate scientists are telling us this is the thin end of the wedge. It's going to get worse and worse. Uh, we will probably do a little better because of where we are mm. in terms of, of climate change. Now, you've been involved in the Climate Change Advisory mm. Council their chair from 2016 to 21, and you're still a member of it. And I know it is something that matters greatly to you. So one of the effects of climate change is economic, not, not the least malevolent effect of it. Um, when I look at, at a map for 2050, I see the area that I live in, which is the North Strand, would be underwater. I'll be dead. Uh, it's not called the North Strand for nothing, of course. It was reclaimed land, mm -hmm. and that is going to be sinking. Um, can you take us through the economic impact of climate change on Ireland, bearing in mind, as we all know, that this is a global problem, that there are things that are way outside our own control? Just well, give us your there are the effects on Ireland and what we do about it, and the effects of the climate and what we do about it, um, which are two different things, but very closely related. In terms of the effects on Ireland, the thing which I am most concerned is about your house. Um, in North Strand. It is about Salt Hill. It's about Cork, Galway, mm. Dublin, and pro probably Limerick. Um, if the sea, le sea level is going to rise dramatically, you see all these photographs of uh, no sea ice in the Arctic. This is really serious for the people of Galway, for the people of Dublin. Um, and I have a daughter who believes in walking the parents like walking the dog. Um, she took shook myself and my wife around the slag heaps of East London when she was living there. Um, and there's this massive Thames barrier, which they put up 20, 30 years ago, thinking they might use it four or five times in the 20 or 30 years. They're using it four or five times every year to protect London from being flooded. And they're going to have to build a massive, bigger barrier. Now, we haven't thought out how we're going to protect Galway. And I'm going to be dead. I'm not going to be drowned. But it is, many of you in the audience may face this problem after 2050 with the, the rising sea level. So that I don't think we have given sufficient attention to. Because if you're going to build a barrier like that across 
Dublin Bay. First of all, there'll be riots um, um, and people like me won't want to destroy the bay. And I, I, I sympathise because it's not my problem, it's your problem. But your fears for the future would overcome your aesthetic distinction. Yes, it, yeah. I, 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 uh, but it, it will be hugely expensive to protect yeah. our cities and it will take decades to do so. And London thought, actually, it, talking about, we've, in the council we talked to our Dutch colleagues, they have been planning for this for a thousand years. Yes. Um, and we're a bit behind. Boy with finger in yeah. the dike. All right, so that's about, uh, and then there's um, high, sea, high flooding and all these other things. I'm less concerned about heat in Ireland. Um, although the problem is the building regs, we, we're, we're really keen on not wasting heat and keeping the heat in. Actually, we need also to design to allow the heat get out because there are going to be increasing periods when we could cook ourselves. And I was really, I was on the board of the Central Bank and the new Central Bank building um, uh, was designed to be A2. Did it work in the heat wave of 2018? It did. Um, there were two floors where it, it, it uh, used too much electricity. One was where the computer servers were and one where the kitchen was. And we put in a special air conditioning for those. But because the, you can open windows to allow the wind to blow through, um, it's, it, it's good to go. So Irish homes, we may insulate ourselves so we don't use any energy, but we may need to get the energy out. So I'm told that that will be much cheaper um, you're not talking air conditioning, you're talking ventilation. But, uh, so, right, that's adapting to climate change. What do we do about stopping climate change? The government have taken this really seriously, as has the Oireachtas, and they spent two years debating and putting in place laws. And they've been so busy debating what the targets should be, they haven't done anything, or they've done very little about it. I, I'm much less concerned about having laws saying you've got to do, get your emissions down than actually doing something about it, putting in laws which in terms of, they're making progress actually on, the, on housing and dwellings. And it's very interesting, last year, households consumed an eighth less energy because the price went through the roof. And it does show that raising the price, as economists have suggested, makes a big difference. Another area where we are not making enough progress and it's turned into a pitch battle, which I don't think is necessary, is agriculture. Yeah. Um, uh, fertilizer use fell by 8% last year, as did NOx emissions because the price, price of fertilizer went through the roof. There are options in terms of multi-species sward. If you, if you plant a number of different species, it fixes the nitrogen rather than using fertilizer. Cheaper and it works. Um, in terms of cattle, um, uh, it, we probably need to reduce cattle numbers, not a popular uh, outcome. But there is science which suggests if you give cattle a particular feed, you can dramatically reduce the emissions. The concern is um, if they're housed in a, in, in a barn all the time, you can check they're taking the medicine. It's like a child. Will the cows take their medicine? And you can't be certain. And you've got to be certain before you can count it. So there are things that need to be done. Um, but... A lot of people are saying, oh, the farmers should go off and do organic farming and grow raspberries or whatever. They pay no attention to the economics. Farmers have to make a living. Yes, they do. And mm. they're making an awful lot of money out of milk. So my priority would be to try and protect milk because they make a lot of money out of it. They make nothing out of beef. The, another area where f farmers planted 10% of their land with trees, mm -hmm. they could make money and suck carbon out of the atmosphere. But the law says you have to prove that no protected species within 15 kilometers of where you plant the trees will be affected. I think biodiversity is hugely important. We haven't paid attention to it, but that is taking things too far. Like when a farmer hears that you're going to have to prove that a bird 15 kilometers away isn't going to be affected um, if you plant a few trees in your land, Maybe Not you'll much. get other kinds of wildlife yeah. in the pantries on your land. It does seem very restrictive. So, my view is we're not going to meet our targets, but I think the glass is half full. I think we are making progress. And I think because it involves, and you raised the issue of we're poor on investment, an awful lot is investment in changing the nature of the grass, which the cows eat, uh, having different species, insulating our homes. It'll take 30 years to do every home in Ireland. It's going to take longer. And I think we, if we start now instead of talking, um, we'll make big progress between 20 and 30 and 35. So I think we will 
change. We are already changing. I just looked at the number outside the station, counted the number of electric taxis. Um, we're seeing progress. So John gets statistics everywhere. <laughs> he never stops looking. <laughs> but we, it, it, is, it, it is going, there's going to be pain. It, carbon tax will rise, prices will rise as a result, as we saw last year. But it's not going to be hugely expensive to the people there, and, and it's worth it. One other question on this, which is the energy question. Now, we, we were told here in this room five years ago by Brian O'Gallagher, who runs the mm. Energy Research uh, Institute in Cork University, that if then we invested five billion in wind, offshore wind, or any kind of wind energy, that in five years we would have been energy uh, secure and exporting it into the grid. That didn't happen. It has now begun. Uh, it was interesting to see that the recent auction for offshore wind mm -hmm. was far more successful than we expected it to be. It's not every day you get a lovely, pleasant surprise mm -hmm. where it turns out the government is doing something absolutely right. But then the question arises, will we have sufficient infrastructure? Do we have a port, for example, that's going to be able to manage this? Will we have enough people to build these extraordinary things? Um, it looks to me like a no-brainer that that is definitely something we should be pouring investment into. What's your own view on it? Um, uh, my train this morning was an hour and 40 minutes late. Because a fox at the signalling equipment. Yes. Um, um, the dog at my but, home. But, but I did learn something as the train stopped uh, prior to coming into the station. If you look out on the, your left, they're building the blades for windmills, mm. these massive blades. So when you wow. talk about somewhere to build them, it's happening um, by the station in Galway. Now, I'm not sure Galway Port could handle offshore wind. Uh, it's not deep enough and big enough. It'll Belfast would probably be the best option. But um, the, the in investment needs to take place. My concern is about the planning and other obstacles. Yeah. And there's a story in today's paper that they want to declare where the, the, where the windmills are to go in the Irish Sea to be a biodiversity protected area, so you can't put the windmills there. Now, the council had a presentation from leading um, uh, natural scientists in Trinity who actually said that offshore wind is likely to be good for biodiversity because apparently the fish discover you can't be fished if you're beside a windmill. Um, and you get an increase in fish species. Well, fish um, are very uh, smart. Yeah. Uh, uh, so actually, um, a lot of offshore windmills and the fish stocks will go up. Uh, so um, there are trade-offs, and it may be there's a particular area, a small area, which you want to protect. But all of the time, the obstacles that we're putting in place and the planning system. So if we could get the system right, we could deliver on time. Mm. But I'm not sure that the public wants to get the system right, um, 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 because uh, you will find people who are being affected by onshore windmills or whatever. Um, uh, the government have to make tough decisions where there will be opposition. It'll be a minority in the population, but they need to make the decisions to allow this to happen. They do. And I mean, I, I have friends who don't like windmills for various things. They don't like the way they look. I always say they're like brancusis, for God's sake. <laughs> and actually think of what they mean. Just think of what these things swirling about mean. They mean we're free from oil and gas, which is such a relief. We've got to get there. Thank you for that great exposition on the, the climate situation. It's kind of optimistic, I think, without being yeah. Pollyanna-ish. So that's, that's where we need to be. Um, John McHale, inflation is bedeviling us at the moment. Please explain inflation to us. I have never really <laughs> understood it. And I'd say a lot of people in the audience don't understand it either. We know what effects it has on us, because we have to pay more money for things we didn't have to pay for before. So tell us, why do we have inflation now, and what can be done to stop it? OK, well, first of all, it may be a little bit of good news that it's coming down. <laughs> uh, so having uh, peaked at uh, over 9% uh, last October, the most recent reading was 6.1%. Uh, so. Um, it is a somewhat complicated uh, thing to explain, but, but I think we can really understand the most recent sort of bout of inflation, which really came about uh, because of COVID. And in kind of very simple terms, it is uh, 
created by an imbalance between uh, demand and supply in the economy. Now, during COVID, you had massive shocks to both the supply capacity of the economy, with huge parts of the economy uh, being effectively shut down, particularly anything that involved face-to-face uh, -face services. But also, you had a huge shock to demand. And somehow or other, sort of miraculously, they sort of balanced out. I actually expected that we would have more inflation during COVID it's, it, itself. Uh, or, or, or the opposite, possibly deflation, depending on how that balance worked out, but, but nothing very much happened. It was in the recovery phase from, from COVID, and there what happened was demand surged ahead uh, as restrictions uh, uh, came off. There'd been uh, a lot of sort of pent-up demand savings done during COVID, which was sort of flowing back, uh, people uh, trying to buy goods and services. But you had lingering supply constraints, um, you know, problems with, uh, uh, with, with, with supply chains, in, in including with, with, with energy. So you, that imbalance between uh, the demand and su supply is really what led uh, to the, the uh, rising prices. Now, the body tasked with dealing with inflation uh, for us as uh, part of the, the, the euro area is the ECB. I think they probably were a little slow initially in recognizing the problem. It's, it's actually quite understandable. The, what they had been grappling with up until then was inflation being too low. Yeah. They have a target for inflation of 2% and they couldn't reach it. Uh, so I think they found it difficult to adapt uh, to the new world uh, with uh, surging inflation. They just put in place a strategy which uh, said that they were actually going to look through any temporary increases in inflation. It was actually kind of a good thing, and I think that led them uh, to react quite slowly. Uh, but then they, they certainly began to, to act, and as I'm sure everybody knows, and some people suffering because of it, there has been a sequence of interest rate increases. The, the main ECB policy rate was actually negative, uh, and is now 3.5%, likely to rise yeah. even a bit further uh, next week. <coughs> the danger now is that I think they may go too far. Mm -hmm. um, uh, interest rate increases only really have their effect on that supply-demand imbalance in, in over a year and a half to two-year period. So the interest rates increases that have taken place already are going to be affecting us over the next year uh, or, or more. Uh, so it may be that further interest rate increases and the, the hawks in the European Central Bank seem to sort of have the upper hand at the moment. Uh, so I think we're definitely going to see an interest rate increase next week. There's been some signs even from the more hawkish members of the European Central Bank that they see the risks. So there's a good chance that the interest rate increases um, I suppose they didn't an increase end. interest rates now. What would happen? Well, uh, then you, uh, inflation is likely to, to stay high. Uh, and become embedded in the in the system, and, and that this, becomes what they call stagflation. Does it? No. Well, that, you would you would need to have a recession as remember well. Remember, I'm really ignorant yeah. about it. So that the economy is both stagnating and and having inflation at the same time right. is what uh, is referred to okay. as, as, right. as stagflation. But you could have sort of permanently uh, high inflation because it becomes embedded into people's expectations. This is really what happened back in the 1970s after the the oil price shocks. Right. You remember the really high inflation then. Yeah. When people were bargaining for wages, they assumed that inflation was going to be high, but that tended to make inflation high, so it can, it can be a uh, self-fulfilling cycle. And that's something the, the ECB are really trying to avoid. They really want people to think that inflation is going to come back to 2%, and that if they think that and they uh, signal that they're really determined to do that, that, that it will. So that's why you see this real determination uh, from, okay. uh, from the ECB. So I think they're, they're, they were right to, to, to respond to it, but, but there is that risk that they'll now sort of go too far, that inflation would come down on its own, but they could actually tip the economy into recession. And you could actually then have a stagflationary situation where the inflation still is sort of above their target. We're still grappling with an inflation problem, but you have an economy in recession, which will eventually bring that, uh, that, that, that inflation down. So it is, it's a difficult balancing act from a, from, from a policy point. go there. Now, I'm looking at your wristwatch upside down, and I think it's 10 to 5. Just check. Yes. Right. I've yep. got to read my phone out to tell me the time. So I'm anxious that all of you get a chance to ask questions. I was going to ask you both about our, presence, our president's recent attack on economists and what your views are about that. <laughs> Somebody might ask that question if they felt like doing it. Um, he criticized universities for teaching outdated economic theory uh, and gave out about neoliberal market fundamentalism, which is a marvelous mouthful. Um, but 
I think we should go to the audience now and give you a chance to ask these two uh, very eminent economists about whatever you want to know. Do we have a roving mic? Jack, where are you? Um, anybody about? OK, there's yeah. a chap here, just down here. No, 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 you're grand, but wait, wait for the mic, because we're recording the session, so we need to hear your words, too. Quick question for both people, a very quick question. We, you, John McHale, you talked about the multinationals and the FDI, obviously very important over the last number of years. Recently, we've lost out on a very big one in, in Intel um, because of the supply of energy or guarantee of supply of energy, but they couldn't guarantee it, and the, the investment went to Poland and Israel, I believe. The second part of that question is to guarantee supply John Fitzgerald, why don't we look at nuclear? Um, we haven't lost out on Intel. They are just completing this year a 17 billion plant in Maynooth. The plant going to Germany is 30 billion. Um, Intel needed to build a second plant in Europe for, for capacity reasons. They, it would have been crazy to stick it in Ireland. The problem, though, is the German government are paying 10 billion to attract that. The Irish government, we, the taxpayers, have not had to pay a cent of it for the 17 billion. If it, the future in Europe is Germany and France will buy up all the really big projects, that is not the right answer. So I'm really concerned about the state aid. Um, that Intel plant could not have come to Ireland. In terms of nuclear, um, the problem is that nuclear power plants come in 1,200 megawatt lumps. That's the smallest nuclear plant you can get today that works. Um, your standard Irish plant is 400 megawatts. That's the biggest. Um, you have to have an electricity system, one ready to go in case one breaks down. So you would need three gas-fired plants running ready to go in case the nuclear power plant broke down. It would be hugely expensive. We are too small a system to have a nuclear plant. It's not an ideological issue, and it's interesting. Eamon Ryan, when he was Minister for Energy in 2008, said he was quite happy to have a debate on the, this because he knew the economics of it. He, he doesn't believe in nuclear in, in Ireland, but he knew that he'd win the debate because it just, you couldn't build. And actually, if you look at the files on the building, uh, in, in, it, it was interesting. Galway and Mayo, when the ESB announced in 1973 they wanted to build a nuclear plant in Ireland, Galway and Mayo lobbied, their TDs lobbied like mad, put it in Galway and put it in Mayo. Um, Interestingly, by 1979, attitudes had changed. And fortunately, the government, for various reasons, didn't build the nuclear plant they wanted because it had been a huge plant which had been far too big for the island. Well, now, that is news, is all I can say. It's not ideological, it's just too big. Great. I love when you get absolute certainty about matters like this. No vagueness. Who's next? This lady here. There you go. Hi, thank you both very much. Just one thing that sort of puzzles me is that it's, the country still has a very big national debt, foreign, foreign debt, and it seems to me that there seems to be very little focus on this and very little political will to pay it off. Um, is that correct? And if so, why? Yeah, uh, so we do have a, a large uh, national debt. If you, if you uh, depending on how you, you measure it, it can look really big or, or, or not so big if in the way it's done sort of internationally compared to GDP actually doesn't look too bad and it's coming down rapidly. But uh, those standard measures kind of overstate the size of the Irish economy. So I think the, the bottom line is, is that you're right when you measure it properly, uh, it, it is big. But it comes back to, to Katrina's sort of earlier question. Uh, we currently have surpluses. If we keep running those surpluses, we will bring it down. Uh, and to prepare you know, for, the, uh, for the future, and particularly the aging of the population, it really makes sense to bring it down. And one way to do that uh, is to use those surpluses uh, to, to, to bring down the national debt. But then you get to, to the points Katrina raised, is that you have uh, huge needs in the economy as well. So you end up sort of balancing, spending that money uh, on investments, essentially, uh, or using it to build up a savings fund, or really equivalently, uh, reducing the national debt. Uh, those two things, in terms of their impacts in the future, are uh, very uh, similar. So, good reasons to do it, but there are other demands on that uh, on that money, and then you get uh, a really challenging situation for politicians. They they 
try to thread that needle. A great question. I won't say economists should be running the country because that would cause widespread outrage, but there are times when you think, you know, if whatever is, you're doing on one hand and on the other, which I appreciate. Uh, it's kind of hard for people, I think, to, to figure out sometimes what that actually means. I mean, obviously, politicians by their nature will want to spend money. Economists, in a way, by their own nature, will want to be prudent about that spending and to make sure if it's happening, it's done in the right way. It doesn't mean that you're opposed to investment. You just want it to be the right sort and at the right time. But it's very hard to square that, isn't it? Yeah, and, and it, it is a problem, I think, uh, with uh, how economists uh, communicate because we really do think of the world in terms of, uh, of trade-offs, so the cost-benefit analysis. Uh, so there usually are two sides to things, and you're trying to find that, that, that balance, um, which is not going to be perfect uh, the, on both sides. Uh, uh, you won't be doing enough debt reduction. You won't be doing enough investment. But you're trying to get that, that, that balance right, as are uh, politicians. But uh, the, the pressures on them can be uh, They're more short -term some, somewhat different. Well, and it, it's interesting, really, one of the, the, the reasons that fiscal councils exist is to try to raise the cost of bad policies that may be good in the, in the short term and sort of good politically, but have these long-term costs. So in a way, it's trying to change that balancing act for the politicians. Uh, now, how much, how much do they take notice of fiscal councils when they're giving out about them? Uh, I definitely wouldn't overestimate that. But it does push that balance a little bit in the direction of the longer-term uh, concerns where they have no shortage of shorter term concerns. So hopefully from the politician's point of view, that it is taking into account that there are reasons why, why we would want to reduce that, that national debt, particularly given the kind of needs that we're going to face in the future. Uh, for including climate change. Including climate change, absolutely. Yeah. Anyone else over here? I can just, is there anyone back up further Hi. before Hello. I move? Hello. I Oh, I have a microphone in my hand. Okay, so I'm great. I'm at the Fire top, head. on to your right, up in the up in the balcony on the right. Ah, great. Hi. Here. Okay. Oh, hi. Yeah. Hi, hi, hi. How's it going? <laughs> Good to see you. We've got light shining in our eyes here. Yeah. Thanks very much. I'm curious to hear about your views on public and sustainable transport. So we've heard a bit about, obviously, the challenges of climate chaos and the impact it will have in our coastal cities, Dublin, Cork and Goy. I've lived in all three cities. I have a sister-in-law who's a flood engineer in Cork, so she's sorted for work for life. Um, and, the, um, and the challenges of our public planning process and housing and how these are all interconnected. And I'd be really keen to hear your views on public participation in public consultations in the planning process for Bus Connects projects and walking and cycle routes. And also then two years after these public consultation processes have happened, when the local authorities roll up with their, their trucks and their tarmac and their bollards and the implementation plans and people might become more aware of what the changes are involved and often there is uh, backlash. And we actually have a project here in Galway where an active travel scheme is, is being halted at the moment. Um, but the public consultation process happened two years ago and it was all hunky-dory. And so the challenges and the nuances of public participation, planning, and creating a more sustainable public transport system. Um, That's for you. I, I, I think your question is to some extent for politicians. Um, my view in terms of climate change is um, we need sustainable transport, like bus connects in Dublin. Um, we worked out um, and there was a consultation and they chose what was probably the best alignment given people's needs. You then go ahead and deliver it and there are going to be a lot of people who are badly affected by it. But um, the people of Dublin as a whole will be better off. Um, and you have to tackle that now. It's easy for me to say that living in an ivory tower, it is much more difficult. I've lived with a politician for uh, a county councillor and minister for, uh, uh, for 20, well, I've been living with her for over 50 years, but uh, uh, it is difficult for the political system to do it. And I think it has got more difficult to deliver infrastructure that we need, in particular in the transport area. Because unless you put in public transport, which will get people from where they are to where they want to go faster than other methods, they're not going to take it. 
And one of the real concerns in the latest census results is there has been a big increase in long distance commuting. People say working from home, it's great and so on. It's great if people stay at home, but they don't. They go in two days a week from, from uh, Athenry into, into Galway or Athenry to Dublin, worse still. Um, and I think that <coughs> we need public transport. We need denser living and Everybody says the national planning framework is the goat way to go, but since it was introduced, we've had houses built all over the place, not concentrated in Galway City, in Dublin City or Cork. So it's a problem for the political system to deliver. We, the citizens, make politicians' life very difficult. But as somebody living in Ivory Tower, I know what the answer should be. But going back to the, actually, the earlier question, I worked for 12 years in the Department of Finance, and it was interesting, as an economist, you'd say, this is the right answer. And just watching one senior, very senior uh, civil servant, he'd go to the minister and say, this is the right answer. The minister would say, can't, won't fly. And that civil servant would say, you're on your own, minister. That was not the right answer for, for a civil servant. Now, there was another uh, uh, Secretary General of the Department of Finance who would say, well, all right, if that won't fly, Minister, here's the second best, here's the third best. It's a very different way of yeah, operating. Absolutely. Having spent most of the rest of my career in an ivory tower, I tell the government what they ought to do. But having seen it from the other side, we live in a democracy which works. Um, and uh, trying to make it work better is not easy, and don't ask economists how to do it. <laughs> nice one, John. Um, where are we? So, a couple more questions here. We have a little bit more time here. There we go. Uh, hi. hi, sir. Hello. Well, uh, this is John, so, and you're also the, the economist, right? So you know, economists like to actually make things, uh, in a way, not wasted. So you know the, the windmill, it has, a, it has a really big blade, like the blades are really huge. Right, so you're an engineer, so why can't you actually embed the solar cell into those blades, therefore doubling the energy for the windmill for just one? That um, sounds very engineering, but you're involved yeah, I, I, with engineering. Well, uh, I, <laughs> well, I think he thinks you're an engineer, so uh, <laughs> you should be able to. I, I, yeah. I, I don't have an answer to that, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> um, just the ones I saw en passant uh, and from the train are just. Um, carbon fiber blades. Uh, so um, I suspect the thing about actually solar cells is they've got to point to the sun, where the windmills have got to point at the wind, and I'm not sure the alignment would be. Sorry, uh, solar cells just make fighting that whole not really the sun, so it could work. Okay. Sorry. All right. Uh, A question. One for, last question for, for John Fitzgerald. Uh, John D. How bad has Brexit been for the UK? <laughs> uh, I, oh, no, no, that's that, that's not really true. And and the 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 possible blowback in terms of the Irish economy, for instance, the uh, imposition of import uh, duties in, going into the UK from the first of October. Uh, all right, it's been bad for the UK sort of they estimate 4% of national income, but it has also had a pretty corrosive effect on the political system, um, and it's not finished yet. In terms of Ireland, yes, you are right. We will see, until now, things go into Britain without any controls. We're going to have, that barrier is going to have a significant effect. Um, I suspect that the impact on the Irish economy has been less bad than we expected, but it's, given that things were so vigorous anyway, it's different, difficult to measure. There's been more in north-south operation, um, uh, trade in both directions. Um, but we have suffered a significant cost, and you will see it in the groceries, that prior to um, Brexit, our shops, it, Marks and Spencers, um, a lorry came every two days from a warehouse in Birmingham with everything that, that it needed. Now they have to, if that lorry comes from Birmingham, they have to clear shirts, um, uh, trousers, everything has got to be cleared separately through customs. So they're very reluctant to do it. Companies have pulled out of Ireland, like Iceland um, has closed, and one of the reasons there. So we are seeing uh, uh, costs, but in, against the background um, of the vigour in the economy, 
we haven't really noticed them, but we will see a negative effect on controls uh, of controls going into Britain. The other thing is that um, the British government has changed dramatically, and they actually want to be friends, which the previous British government didn't. And I think that that uh, that we will see a greater willingness to deal with problems. And one of the areas, the Department of Finance saw Brexit coming before the referendum was called and commissioned the ESRI to do a series of studies on the implication of Brexit for Ireland. And one of them I did on the energy sector and we were very concerned because the bulk of our gas comes through Britain. Last year, if the United Kingdom had stopped export of gas to Ireland and kept it all for itself, prices would have been very much lower in Britain and we would have been wiped out. Um, until last year, electricity always flew, with one exception of the heat wave, the canicule in 2003. Electricity always flowed from France to Britain, but last year the nuclear stations all broke down in France, bad timing, and electricity flowed all the time from Britain to France. If the British had cut the cable, electricity prices would have been much lower in Britain and France would have had huge problems. So behind the scenes, the United Kingdom has begun to act in a responsible fashion as a neighbour. And given what they could have done to us last year, and they didn't, when the temptation was greatest, I would be hopeful that um, some of the future um, problems will be ameliorated by good relations between France, the British, well, between the EU and the British government. Um, like they want to, like the funding for research at an EU level, which is so important to universities, they cut themselves off from that. They were given an option of being part of it. They, the Boris dropped out. Now, uh, Sunak is trying to get back in. Um, so I think you're seeing uh, the worst of it um, over, um, possibly with the exception which could affect Irish agricultural exports to, to, to Britain. Um, they've delayed the restrictions because of the difficulties, and they may delay them further, but I think inevitably there will be some. Okay. We're out of time, I'm afraid. Uh, this has been fascinating. I have learned a great deal from listening to both of you, and I want to thank you both on behalf of the audience for giving us your time today and for endeavouring to explain in clear and precise language something that most people find difficult to understand. I think you've succeeded really well in doing that. Thank you both so much, Professor John McHale and Professor John Fitzgerald. Thank you.